Welcome back to Locked In with Ian Bick. On today's episode, I have Chris Arevalos here to tell his insane story of how he winds up in federal prison after getting arrested by the DEA and the FBI, manages to get sent to one of the worst penitentiaries in America, and gets forced into joining the Mexican mafia gang and becomes a soldier for this notorious gang in federal prison. I wanna give a big thanks to Lost Trail Communications for sponsoring today's episode. They are a great company that provides affordable marketing and public relations services to small businesses, startups, and creators. Book a free consultation at losttrailcommunications.com and mention Locked In to receive 25% off the service of your choice. Thank you guys, our viewers and listeners, week after week who tune into the show, who message me on social media platforms, who email me, who want to come on the podcast and share their story. I would not be here without you guys. You mean the world to me, and I'm excited to see where our journey goes. We have a lot of exciting episodes on the horizon. We have a brand new studio, amazing equipment, an amazing team behind us, and we're ready to bring this to the next level. I hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy my interview with Chris Arevalos. Chris, welcome to Locked In, man. Where'd you travel to us today from? You had quite the journey. Yeah, I'm from Austin, Indiana, southern Indiana. Uh, it's called Pistol City. You Pistol know, City. I'll get into that a little <laughs> bit later while it's dubbed Pistol City. Uh, we were we were named that back in the 70s. But uh, I flew in from, uh, from Cincinnati Airport. I flew into LaGuardia. I took the rental up to uh, Danbury. I wanted to get out into the um, boroughs of New York, but people were like, man, <laughs> whenever you touch down, Chris, just keep going to Danbury. You know, don't be out there mingling, getting in trouble, because my main objective is to come up here, you know, and, and tell about my story uh, about my hometown of Austin, you know, and I didn't want to get in any trouble, you know, in between. And <laughs> I wanted to make sure, you know, I made it here, you know, and then uh, tonight I might cut loose a little bit, though, after we film this. Yeah, I, you have great energy, man. We've been in touch for the last couple months, and uh, I'm glad we were able to do this. And we are the second guest in our new studio um, sitting down to record, so... It's an honor, man. I'm glad yeah, you're it's here. It's an man. honor to be here, and I'm glad to be the second. Well, I heard you're having Chevy Chase up, man. Uh, uh, is yeah, that true? By the time your episode comes out, Chevy Chase will have, the episode oh, will have already dropped. It, That's going to be awesome. Pretty exciting, man. Heck yeah, knowing Chevy Chase is going to be sitting here in the <laughs> same same chair. That's, that's cool, man. Yeah, so yeah, let's dive into it, man. Um, you just told me where you're from. Did you grow up there as well? Yes, um, I grew up in Scott County, Indiana. Uh, but but I went to school. I started going to school in Austin, and then my parents divorced, and then uh, my mom remarried, so we moved to uh, Jackson County, Indiana, Crothersville. That's where I went to school, and uh, we moved out there, man, and it was like in the middle of the cornfields, you know, in Indiana. That's a, uh, basically all there is out there is cornfields, so I grew up country. I'm a country boy, you know, and um, all I really had was my, was my hunting dogs, my squirrel dogs, and my four-wheeler and my boat. You know, there was the Muscatatak River. Uh, right down the road from me, so um, I stayed out on the river a lot fishing, you know, out there in in uh, Jackson County. Did you have siblings? Yeah, I have a stepsister named Elisa and a stepbrother named Gabe. Um, he's 14. My stepsister Elisa, she's doing really well. Uh, she just got married a few years ago, and they got their own house. She has a wonderful child named Orlando. She keeps him very active in sports, uh, tennis, basketball. I occasionally go to, to watch him do those things. So she's doing very good. And uh, were you close with your parents growing up, even your stepdad or your real dad? Yes. Um, you know, there was alcoholism in, in the home at, at an early age, you know, from, from all I could remember was alcohol and smelling the marijuana smoke. So that led to, you know, a lot of internal problems with the family, you know, between my mother and father. And uh, ultimately they d divorced but uh, I've grown up around alcohol and drugs all my life. You think that had a negative influence on you as you would get older and start experiencing things for your your own self? Uh, most definitely did. You know, I can attribute uh, most of the failures and obstacles I've had in my life um, due to the um, substance abuse issues that I've dealt with. And did you have a lot of friends in high school or were you more of like a loner? I know you said you like to, to be out mm -hmm. in, in the farms and in the country yeah. land. Um, but what was like the, the high school for you? Well, um, 
so like I said, uh, I went to Austin uh, Elementary until my parents divorced. My mother got remarried, so then we moved to Jackson County, out way out in the country, on a, off 256. I lived what they ha they call county roads, uh, and uh, man, we was so far out there, in that we didn't even uh, the, the the mailman didn't even deliver the mail. We would have to go into town in Austin to get our mail. So you know, give you an idea of how rural I was out there. But as uh, far as the high school, so. Um, I went to Crothersville starting in the third grade, you know, and I had some really good friends up there, Tanya Stidham, uh, Laura Myers, and I had some really good friends there at Crothersville. But uh, I moved back to Austin because uh, alcohol struck again, you know, with my mother and my stepfather. And uh, there wasn't any physical abuse, but, man, there was sure a lot of emotional abuse, you know. They would just take off and, and, and party and stay drunk, you know, and leave me to the house all by myself. So I didn't have any guidance or any mentors growing up. It was just myself, you know, and, and uh, the country, you know, whatever I could utilize to spend my time, the outdoors, nature, you know, on the river, my hunting dogs and guns and stuff like that. So I went back to Austin High School uh, my junior and senior year, and uh, I was already pretty, pretty well known, you know, by that time. Because I would be coming in on the weekend from Crothersville. My uh, mother would drop me off to, to visit my dad, you know. And uh, my dad had quit drinking, you know, a few years prior to that. And now he's a, he's a man of religion, my father. He's real deep into the church. He's converted his life over to God, and he's doing really well. So, um, but, but, you know, I had so much uh, anger, you know, built up inside of me. I didn't want to hear anything. You know, I just wanted to have my own way about life. So when I come into Austin at my um, junior and senior year, you know, I started partaking, you know, in the substances, namely marijuana and alcohol. And, um, um, yeah, one time I woke up and uh, I was tripping acid. I took some acid one night and fell asleep and I woke up tripping. And I had already been warned, hey, you know, you can't miss any more school <laughs> So, uh, man, I tried my best to get to school in, you know, I, I was uh, under influence. So I went there and they could tell something was wrong with me. And they called my dad and, and they sent me home and, and they had a meeting with the principal. And my dad had to go up there and he was like, look, you know, we, we've tried with him. You know, man, his mother, it's a rough way for him, you know, but um, he, he wants to finish high school very badly. So, um, you know, he was telling him because my dad, he was originally um, from Texas. You know, he was born here in Texas or there in Texas, and my grandfather was as well. But they traveled to different places like migrant camps, California, Michigan, Florida, uh, Ohio, to pick vegetables. And they, they ended up up there in Austin. And um, on, the, on the outskirts of town, there was this thing called uh, Mexican camp. And that's where all the migrants stayed. And, um, you know, they endured a lot of hardships over there, a lot of racism, a lot of unnecessary treatment from other people. And so... Um, I heard him through the door telling the principal, hey, you know, we're from the camp, and, and he wasn't even supposed to make it this far, you know. Uh, he was conceived, man. His mother was picking vegetables, you know, in a field in Jackson County, and, and that's when he would, you know, that, that's how he'd come about. So I was like, man, I started hearing all these things, you know. I'm like, man, I don't have no chance. I don't have a chance in hell in life, you know. But um, But I do have a chance, you know. Later on in life, you know, I, I figured out, you know, hey, uh, there's a power, man, greater than greater than anybody, you know. And um, I finally, I finally found that power, and I was able to turn my life over. But um, that's about the extent of the high school. I just ran around partying all the time, you know. And um, I graduated. I ended up graduating. I had to come back extra, extra six months or whatever it was, or um, and, and to get my credits. But I made it, and then I ended up joining the Marine Corps. You joined the that. Marine Corps, yeah, really? Yeah, I joined the Marine Corps after that. Did, yeah. you, did you have aspirations before that, or was that like a fallback because you didn't know what you were doing, you didn't want to go into a college, or you couldn't get into a college? Well, what was like the I, mindset? Yeah, and at that point, I didn't even know anything about education. You know, that was the furthest thing from my mind because my mother and father, they only have a grammar school education. I think my mother, she had a sixth grade education, and my father, he had like a seventh grade education. But one thing that, that my stepdad did do you know, was um, he taught me numbers, you know, and he taught me the importance of math and being able to uh, convert numbers, you know. So that was a forte of mine, numbers, you know. I was really good with numbers. So um, 
but I didn't have any aspirations. I would answer your question about college. I didn't even know what college was. You know, my father didn't even know anything about that stuff or, or my mother, you know. But uh, in the Marine Corps, though, the recruiter come by one day. He was in the, um, the library there in Austin High School. And uh, he was like, hey, come here. So I started talking to him. He was like, what do you like doing, you know, this and that? And I would be telling him, you know, I like to hunt and fish and stuff. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, you spend time with your family? I'm like, yeah. He's like, what's well, a good memory? I was like, well, my mom and dad used to take me to this place called Henryville Forestry to fly a kite, man. And I always thought that was cool. And he's like, well, you know, there's these people across the world and, and they're, they're harming people, you know, over flying kites it's, it's outlawed and it's banned over there and, and is there a chance they might come over here one day you know he was pumping me full of stuff and i'm like man that would be terrible not to be able to fly a kite you know and have people over here persecute you and i'm like you know i, I was like i want to try to stop that from happening you know so that's when i joined the marine corps you know it was all over because i didn't want people come to america to, to keep us from flying a kite do you think if your parents didn't suffer with alcoholism your life would have turned out very differently maybe you would have gotten a better understanding of education and and maybe had some type of dream to follow oh absolutely and because um you know like i said with my parents with such a limited education you know they didn't teach me much when it come to school but one thing my mother did do though i know i'd wake up every morning to breakfast you know and she'll be put me on that school bus and no matter what if i had a temperature or whatever you know i was on that school bus i had perfect attendance and she would tell me hey look you know i didn't have a chance to be educated and, and your father didn't either he she was like you have to go as far as you can with education she's like it's your passport to the future you know but things got rough there in the household after she remarried with alcohol and they started leaving me by myself but uh, to answer your question I know for 100% certain if I would have had mentors, a mother and a father uh, raising me properly, uh, my life would have definitely been for the better. You know, I probably wouldn't have went down some of the avenues that I went down that, that led me to, uh, to to criminal lifestyle. Were you ever looking at other kids, maybe that you're friends with or other kids in general and saying, man, I wish I had that. Like, I wish I had that supportive family. I wish I had uh, anything, you know, that love maybe that you weren't receiving. Oh, yeah, you know, and it hurts so much, man, because um, I will be going to school and there'll be like, um, I forget what they call it, <clears throat> but it was like a where your parents would come in, you know, like a career day with your mom or your dad, and you invite one of them in, you know, and I remember people, parents coming in saying they're doing this and they're doing that and everything. My parents never come in, you know. I was one of the very few uh, kids that didn't have their parents come in. You know, and it's very shameful, man, and hurtful, you know. But um, you just got to get through it. That's tough, man. Uh, you know, it makes people like me um, have a more appreciation for life and how I grew up because not everyone grows up in, like, that good supportive family. And I don't think at the time when I was in high school I ever looked at the people that didn't have that, like, if the roles were reversed and thought about what they were going through. And, you know, hopefully, like, the people that are listening, even the younger audience, you know, takes that second to really appreciate that uh, and learn from that and try to give back to the world in that sense. Oh, I agree with you. Uh, parenting and parenthood is, is should be priority number one, you know. Um, even if it's unpla unplanned uh, pregnancy, you know, even if your child is, is out of wedlock or whatever, I mean— once you find out, the lady finds out she's pregnant, that should be priority number one. Everything should be dropped. You know, you shouldn't choose no man over your child. You should focus 100%. So for those ones that are listening, the teenagers in Indiana and Austin up there that, that are enduring uh, hardships, you know, with unplanned pregnancy, uh, you know, um, I highly recommend, you know, that you focus um, on your child, on your children, and raising them, you know, morally morally and ethically sound, you know, to be sound people and productive citizens of society. Absolutely. So you joined the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. how, how long do you end up serving in the Marines? Four years. I, uh, four years. I was a tank crewman on M1A Abrams' uh, main battle tank. I was stationed in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, in Jacksonville. I didn't go anywhere. There wasn't any combats or anything, um, uh, wars going on at the time. Furthest I made is that California would fly out here once a year for a CACS com combined arm exercise. It would be from uh, December to March, so I'd just be staying out in the Mojave Desert out in the middle of nowhere, man. You see nothing but desert and, and mountains out there. So 
I stayed out there, you know, three or four months every year. And then we would fly back to uh, North Carolina. What time period is this? This is 96 to 2000. And how, how old are you? 18? Uh, yeah, 18. Yeah, 18 I was 18. Uh -huh. When I joined, I was 18. Did you enjoy it? Like, did, did you think to yourself at that time period, I like this, like I could see myself doing it? Or are you still kind of like lost <laughs> in the world trying to figure it out? Uh, those tanks are still, you know, they're still so, um, and we had a sleeping bag, so we'd be sleeping on top of the tour. I was a gunner. I'd be down there in that gunner station falling asleep, you know, <laughs> and uh, my staff sergeant kicking my helmet, you know, he's trying to call me and I was asleep. We'd be up for two or three weeks, you know, no sleep is simulated war, you know, no showers, no hot meals, MREs, you know, and everything. So, um, I was thinking, I was like, you know, there has to be a better way than this. I love America. I'm 100% I'm American, diehard patriot, man, and, and I love America. But um, I'm going to do my four years in service, and I think I'm going to go on back to Indiana yeah. because that was a rough life in the Marine Corps as a combat MOS. And like I said, you know, you're always uh, doing maintenance on the tanks. And um, we had a 50 cal up there, Browning, and um, – uh, M240 Golf inside, and then one outside, and a nine millimeter bread, a holster, and it got really hot inside those tanks. In, and here we are in, in 29 Palms, California, 100 and some degrees plus inside. You know, so, uh, whenever I become a tank commander and we got further out in the out in the desert, I told my crew, I'm like, look, you can strip down to your skivvy shorts, man. You know, your green shorts. So here we are, four jarheads out there in the, in the Mojave Desert, cruising a tank, nothing but our nine millimeter K bar helmet. And a pair of PT shorts and combat boots, man. Yeah. So, Chris, where does it turn? Like, oh. I, life is, I, I, you, you did have some trauma in your childhood mm -hmm. with the alcoholism, but you, you managed to pull through high school, get into the military. Mm. Where do things take a turn south? That's where it turns south, Ian. Uh, while I was in the Marine Corps one night, we had a mine plow on top of our, on our tank, and um, we went over an embankment. And we were like this, basically. And uh, like I said, I was a gunner, and I hurt my back. So uh, they started giving me these pain pills called Tylox, and um, it was uh, very, very potent. And they would be giving me big tubs of them. So, um, you know, I got hooked on those. And um, right before I got out six months, I would probably be, I would be going back to Indiana with big tubs, and I would be taking them to a guy named Claude. He's dead now. And uh, he, he's, he was my friend, uh, William Neese, my, uh, he was his grandfather. And uh, real fast about William, uh, he was six years old one night, William, up there in Austin. And I was like 16. And uh, William had found a bunch of marijuana one time out in the cornfield. So we dried it, got it prepped, ready to go. And I told him, hey, you know, I think I know where to sell this stuff. And uh, he's like, okay, you know, he's six years old. He's just a kid, you know, he's a hustler. So um, I went over there to the place, and the guy, he hadn't paid us our money, you know. And I'm like, man, I don't know what to do, you know. And uh, William's like, in his garage back here, he's got like a bunch of cases of beer. So one night we went over there, and we, and we got into a shed, started to get a bunch of beer. Next thing I know, I heard a gun click, uh, 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 the uh, hammer click back. And um, I heard somebody say, don't move. Next thing I know, I felt beer bust all over me. And William, six years old, you know, little bitty guy, he hit the guy in the back of the head with a can of beer and it knocked him out. And uh, I took off running, you know. I was like, I ain't staying around. He's hollering, hey, help me carry the beer. He's wild, William, you know. But he's doing really good today. He's got his own business going and everything. That's my, that's my homie right there, William. But I was taking the pills up there to Austin, and uh, I noticed the business started slacking in, and people was like, hey, there's this new drug. It's called Oxycontin. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, uh, ever tried? I'm like, no, I ain't tried it. And he's like, man, it's better than those Tylox, anything you've ever taken. I'm like, no, I've never taken it. So I come home, discharged from the Marine Corps. Seems like the whole town, you know, was on. And I'm like, I, let me see one of them. They're little bitty round things. And I'm like, uh, this is a, he's like, this is a 20 milligram. I'm like, how much? It was like $10. I'm like, what? For a pill? He's like, yeah, in the 40s or 20. And and the eighties are um, fifty or something like that, forty or fifty. I'm like, man, I ain't paying no forty or fifty dollars for no pill, but uh, that's all you could get, you know. So I ended up taking those pills and I got hooked on them. And oh, they made me so sick. The whole town was hooked on them. And the drugs, the 
wasn't around before then, or at least in that area? No, it wasn't around that area. I, I did some research on it, and I think they come out in, like, 95, I think. Who is bringing them in? Is it, like, a, a gang? Or is it the, no. the Mexicans? Is it the white people? What, who's bringing them? No, there's no gangs up there, up there. And uh, what happened was um, the people who manufactured the um, they were targeting doctors in Appalachians, you know, poor communities and rural areas. So the doctors quit writing the basic prescriptions for pain pills and started giving everybody oxys. The doctors were getting a kickback, see. So now all the older people that were on pain medicine, you know, basic pain medicine, they're getting, you know, and, and the word got out. So this started with the doctors is who it started with prescribing them. So you're saying like the medical industry Absolutely. Help fuel the the addiction. Absolutely. Isn't Absolutely. that wild? To well, think about? It's, um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say the name of the manufacturing company that, that made them, but they did get uh, filed just bankruptcy not too long ago, and they're from Connecticut. The, the it's interesting to see someone that's a survivor like yourself of of the addiction, and I'm sure you've done a ton of research. Yes, and that affected your life. Oh, it crippled. While they me. were making millions, people like you, and there's millions of people like yourself that yes. went through this and yes. it was all because of that one accident that happened to you yes they targeted the lower class rural areas as a manufacturing company and it really hit austin indiana very hard it hit us very hard and um, actually you know um we we have the largest um hiv outbreak in the world per capita up there wow yeah and they had to open up a, a needle exchange clinic because the, the virus was, was spreading so fast the former president mike pence uh, he signed in the legislation and made it legal for a uh, needle exchange program in scott county and he come on the news for it there's been people come up there interview me uh bbc news i was reading uh, that article yeah, yeah british broadcasting they flew from manchester england over to um to film me because the feds called me the demon that's what they label me, man, because I brought so many uh, hundreds of thousands back from the cartel in Mexico. So back to Austin, yeah. So now, you know, it's catching fire. The guys are catching fire. Everybody's hooked on them, and they're injecting them intravenously. They're injecting the pills. You know, that was the best way to do it, you know. So, um, you know, right at the time, you know, it's everywhere, and, and I'm hooked on them. Everybody's hooked on them. My friends are dying from them and everything, and um, it crippled me. I mean, I was hooked severely bad on them for like two or three years, and and I lost a lot. What was that feeling for you that wanted to keep, that wanted you to keep doing them after you tried them for the first time? Like, what would you? How would you best describe that feeling to someone that's never been drugs that done that kind of drug before? Well, it was the best feeling up to that point. It was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. You know, when, when I put that needle in my arm with that. Um, it seemed like if I had some kind of trouble in my mind, it was all gone away. It was all gone away, and I had a warm feeling from head to toe. And I was the happiest, joyous, uh, kind, loving person ever, you know, and I didn't care about anything. Even if I didn't have a penny in my pocket or a crumb of food on, on, on the table, as long as I had that shoot in my arm, I didn't care about you or nobody else. Wow. It was terrible. And they call me the demon because of it, and I, it was a demon. That's what it was. How does your addiction, your own addiction, translate into a business where you're doing yeah. illegal activities and you're selling? Because it doesn't seem like you would have been very functionable if mm -hmm. you're if you're doing those types of drugs. No, there's a um, church that I go to, Redemption Pentecostal Church of God. It's on Wilbur Avenue, and um, right across from that church is these apartments. And they're known as Wilbur Avenue Apartments. They're two-story, very small. Well, it used to flood back there in the back because the sewer system was broken, and people's sewer just go right out into the yard. So um, one time I was sitting there, and there was these kids, man. There was needles laying everywhere, and there was these kids uh, putting the sewer water into the needles, and they were squirting each other, you know, like like with water. It's like water guns, but there were needles and I'm sitting there, and the girl I was dating at the time, she come out there, and she must have been able to see the disgust in my eyes, you know. And she's like, "This," uh, she's like, "Well, Chris Revlo, she's like, it doesn't get any better than this, does it?" She said, "You're we're at the um, butthole end of the earth, you know." She used the A word, she, you know. She said, "This is the worst as that is." She said, "This is bad." I said, "Yeah, the only way to go is up from here, baby. You know, I'm out of here." 
And uh, she's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm, I'm going somewhere tomorrow. I said, I don't know where, but I'm getting out of Austin. You know, I'm done with it, you know. And I counted my, I had 14 needle marks in my arm that, that night. And uh, when I seen those kids, man, with those needles, putting that sewer water and those needles, little bitty kids in diapers, and they're going around shooting it. I was like, this ain't the place, you know, this this has got to be something different. You know, like I told her, we're at the very bottom right now in Austin. And I said, the only way to go was up, you know. So um, that next morning, I had a lady named Jackie Johnson. Her son passed because of drugs not too long ago. He overdosed. And uh, she, I told her, hey, look, you know, I want to get out of here. And she took me to uh, Louisville to a place uh, like a like a drug place and i stayed in there and, and i got straightened out and i met a girl and um we started dating and, we, and i moved in with her and uh i told her about austin i'm like look you know i'm from a place up here it it's it's heaven you know uh if if i could find a connect you know i think i could go down there you know and take it over and she went down there with me and she's like man you're right she's like, i ain't never seen nothing like this before you know People walking up down the street, you know, holding their arms, blood running from their arms and stuff. It's not like that anymore, and I'll get to that. It's a, it's in a recovery revolution, Austin, Indiana now. You know, and they have people like uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa uh, Patrick Webster um, and Kelly Hans and Shanita Flemion. Uh, those people are at the forefront of recovery revolution. Austin was once known to a place to come from all over the country, basically, and get your but now they're coming there, you know, to, to, to do recovery. And you can get help in a heartbeat in recovery because of those ladies. So I get with the girl, you know, and uh, she's like, yeah, I know somebody, you know. Uh, he owns a strip club. I used to strip for him. She introduced me to him, and he turns me on to some of them. I take him up there, get rid of him in Austin, come back. And uh, long story short, he can't, he can't supply me, you know, with enough of them. So I meet this Muslim dude from Detroit. He's cool. I got nothing but love for the Muslims, man. And, and yeah, and um, he's cool, and uh, he, he supply me good. You know, he's bringing me. I called him logs. He would bring at nighttime. He would bring me uh, about that long with uh, black electrical tape. There would be started out, there would be maybe ten to 12,000, you know, at uh, each one. So he'd bring them there, and I would get them off pretty quick. You know, a couple weeks, I moved 10, 15,000 in a couple weeks so um he ends up he comes to me one time he says hey he's like man you made me a lot of money he said and it's time to quit he's like i found a, a gas station we're going to turn it into a tire shop he's like i want you to come there and just watch over things man you know you don't have to do nothing i said what are you saying he's like i'm not going to supply you anymore and i'm like you know i'm not going to do that man i'm from austin you know i'm a natural born hustler that's all I know. I'm not going to do no business. You know, I'm about making money. Do you so, think you started getting greedy at that point? Yes, because you, you saw know, the money flowing in. Not only that, you're talking about a boy that um, that on the weekend there was nothing to eat at his grandpa's in Austin, man. And I would go in old abandoned houses, man, looking for food. And, and I sometimes I one time I found a, uh, a box of cereal. And the building, the house was infested with cockroaches in, and I found a box of cereal, man, roaches crawling all that box of cereal, and I just dumped the whole thing out. And I was separating the cornflakes from the cockroaches and the roaches' eggs, man, and I didn't even have no um, milk or anything. I put water in it. So you're talking to somebody from Pistol City that come up with nothing, you know, in the middle of the cornfield. So when I got a taste of that money, it was like nothing else, you know. I was eating, man. I was putting food in my stomach, and I was putting clothes on my feet, or on, my, on, on, my, on my body, you know, shoes on my feet. And, um, you know, when I got a taste of that, that fast, good money from them, there's no way anybody was going to try to coerce me and start no business. How much money are you making at this point? Do you have an idea? Are you struggling to get started? According to U.S. Bank, 78% of small businesses fail because they lack a well-developed business and marketing plan. Lost Trail Communications is a strategic marketing and PR firm that offers affordable marketing and public relations services to small businesses, startups, and creators. Let me break down exactly why you should pick Lost Trail to help with your startup. Lost Trail Communications have worked with over 100 small businesses and creators across many industries. They are huge supporters of those re-entering society like myself from the justice system and love working to help those in need change their lives. They have over 20 years experience specializing in creating marketing plans, 
go-to market strategies, social media management, and public relations support. They will take your startup, small business, or social media presence to a whole new level. They offer several different affordable payment options, including 0% financing. Most importantly, these guys get the job done. Make sure you schedule a free consultation by visiting LostTrailCommunications.com and mention Locked In when booking to receive 25% off any service you choose. Once again, a huge special thanks to Lost Trail Communications for coming on board and sponsoring this week's episode. Well, at that time, the odds had went up because there was a shortage. You know, like I say, doctors were getting busted. Some of the pharmacists were, were getting busted. So um, the, for the 40s, they were going for $40 a piece, and I was getting them for uh, for like uh, 7 or $8 in the 80s, they were going for 80, and I was getting them for like um, 10, I think, $10 a piece. And what would happen was um, you could go down there and piece them out all day long for $80 milligram. But I had three or four homeboys that were real close, and I would give them to them on front for like 50 or 60. They'd make 20 or 30 a piece off of them, not have to put no money up to me. I'd bring them straight to their house. They would call me, you know, I'd come back up 65 from Louisville, get off the Austin exit, go pick that money up, and then come straight back. So, you know, I had, um, we had built a new house, you know, I had got a new Camaro uh, shipped in from Cali. Shipped yeah. in. Yes. So we're talking That's... hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. In, a, in one week? Oh, or... no, 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 not okay. a week, you know, probably in about a couple months. You know, I'm probably making about clearing, clearing weekly, probably making about, no, nine or ten thousand, which week. is a lot of money for a kid. You're for, early twenties, yes, and you've yes. never had that, man. Especially from somebody from Austin, Indiana. Go do ahead. you do you think that if you were never under the influence of the drugs themselves, that you never would have gotten into this enterprise, or do you think if you had found them, even if you weren't using them, the money would have caught up and you would have still sold them regardless? Well, at, when I left Austin that, that night with 14 needle marks in my arm, uh, I, I, like I said, I got off of them. I went to a rehab. I quit it. But I did get on this drug called methadone, and it had a blocker in it. You know, if you do the methadone, you can't get high off any other. And one of the reasons I've done that, as I'll tell you later in the story, is um, I get put over a lot, you know, and I'd have some and I'd be able to eat them and not feel the effect, you know. So when the cops are behind me getting ready to walk up, I would just pop a handful of the and the evidence is gone, and I'm not overdosed, and I'm not even feeling them because the methadone has a blocker in it. But to answer your question, yeah, of course, man. Um, you know, I knew the ins and outs when I left Austin. Hey, you know, I know the suppliers, and, and from the Marine Corps, um, I used a military strategy. The first thing you do to your... Um, to your opponent is uh, cut their supply line off, you know, and I knew when people were bringing them, I knew when they got their pills. So I went to those people. And I said, look, the game's going to change. I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to lock it down. Here's how it's going to happen. I said, you either get in or you get out with me. And then what's going to happen is I know you're taking the pills over here on this day. I know how much they're giving you. I'm going to give you 10 more and I'm going to give it to you on advance. So now you've got all the major players in Austin. They're like, man, where's my connection people coming from the doctors they're not coming anymore you know so i cut the supply line off i'm getting all the from the street and i'm getting them from my muslim connection so basically you know you have your out-of-staters that would come in periodically you know but i had it locked down at that point do you think the military prepared you in like a dominance role to be able to assert yourself and take over because you were like a quiet kid growing up that liked his alone time and now you're kind of turning into a kingpin a little bit in this town, <laughs> yeah. you know. In in a way, you are. Yes, I slowly morphed and I slowly morphed into it. Like like you say, you know, I was quiet coming up in school and everything, you know, and um, I'm slowly morphing into someone that I I just never thought I would be. And it, like I said, I didn't wake up one day and say, "Hey, uh, I'm going to lock the whole town down. I'm going to take over the uh, game." I, it didn't happen that way, you know. It gradually progressed. And with all the money coming in, there was no way I could turn my back on that at any point because, like you say, I'm coming from someone of parents that had no education, that, that worked in the fields. You know, in Jackson County, Indiana, you know, we had hardly any money coming in, just enough to eat and nothing else. So there was no way that I could turn down that money. But, but the military it did prepare me, you know, because, like I say, um, 
I would set up like what I call a headquarters, you know. Uh, one week I would go to this house, my friend. We would sell that house. Heat come on, I'd switch over to the other side of town. And growing up, I seen a lot of people getting busted, you know, in their house, selling out of their house. And I'd say, man, you know, uh, why, don't you, why don't I just be a mobile drug dealer in my car? And that's what I did, you know. I didn't have a place. I wasn't a sitting duck in Austin. I didn't have a, a house that, that draw the heat. You know that they could do surveillance i had four different vehicles that i switched you know one week i would drive one vehicle next week i would drive another one you know i rotated the vehicles yeah so your connect ends up saying he wants out right where does it go from here okay What's next? so um so that by this time you know i'm helping my homeboys some of them are doing good some of them got their children back you know some got their license back. Some of them started business, you know, and I'm like, man, I, I can't, you know, I can't stop, you know, for myself either because I don't know anything else to do. I'm out of the Marine Corps. I never had a job up to that point. Just hustling, you know, being from Austin, I was just a hustler, and I didn't want to stop. So the Muslim guy cut me off from Detroit. So um, I tell my girl, she's like, man, what are we going to do now? And I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. So I started thinking. I said, hey, I know somebody that might be able to turn me on to a connection in Mexico, maybe a, a, like a high-powered plug, you know. She's like, well, she broke the laptop out. She's like, where are we going, you know, let's get the tickets. And I'm like, let's, let's shoot down to San Diego, you know. So I make the communications necessary, and the guy's calling me. He's like, hey, Chris, he's like, uh, you don't know me and everything, but so-and-so told me, you know, that maybe you're interested in coming down here and talking to something. I'm like, of course I am. So uh, we went down to San Diego. We crossed from T1 into Mexico, T San Isidro to T1 in Mexico. And uh, I had to sit down with uh, Hefe, they call him, as the boss, you know, of the cartel down there. Um, like He was a lieutenant. He was lieutenant in the cartel. And I sit down with him, and uh, he was like, look, so-and-so uh, spoke very highly of you. They say you're a very integrity-oriented uh, mind person. You're very hungry, you know, and, and determined. And he's like, that's what it takes in here. He's like, you have to have loyalty with me, you know, and for sure never to tell. And I said, I would never do anything like that to you, you know. And he's like, okay. And he's like, I'm going to turn you on to, to a plaza boss. And what a plaza boss is down there in Tijuana, there's different markets and stores, and um, they control every section. So he sent me over there. I sit down with uh, Puma because he's dead now. Puma was his name. I sit down with him, and he's like, what can we do? And I said, man, I'm looking for these things called And he's like, oh, okay. So um, they knew what they were. And uh, he went and he's digging through these trash bags, man, full of big tubs, full of pills. So um, he, he showed them to me. I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And he's like, how many do you want? You know, I told him. He's like, well, you got the money? I was like, I didn't bring it today. I said, I'll bring it tomorrow. And he's like, okay. So the next morning, we get up, you know, and we go over there, and uh, we, we conduct the trade, the business. The first time I, I bought the from the cartel, what was that day? And um, we end up flying back up there to uh, Indiana. But um, Are I you have paying the paying on with cash on the spot. Yeah, cash. So no credit or anything. Oh, I never do credit. I never do credit with the cartel. What's it like at, for a young twenty-year-old, you know, early twenties, to go and sit down in a meeting with the cartel? Because I'm sure you've heard stories, especially in your time in the military and yeah. and just in the world we live in in that time period. Were you scared? Are, are you like, what's your feelings, your thoughts? Uh, my girlfriend was scared. She was very scared. You brought uh, your girlfriend with you? Yeah, she's the one that carried the cash over. She was hard. Oh, she was man. a soldier boy. She was, man. She's she was, a real one, yeah. Yeah, she was a soldier for me, man. But she loved me and I loved her, you know. And I'm like, look, we're going to ride it till the wheels fall off, you know. I'm going to bond you out. Something happens and I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the rap for it. So, you know, don't worry about nothing. You're going to be all right. So, um, but what it was like, you know, um, when we went into the plaza, I walked before we crossed the road in. There was a telephone, and there was a cop on the phone, right? And I'm, like, tripping out. I thought, man, they set me up. You know, <laughs> this is a heck of a way to go. So the dude, the cop, stand there, and I'm staring at him, and he's looking at me, shaking his head, and he pointed that way. And I went down there, and there the dude was, Puma, and he's like, come here. You know, so we're sent back there, and it's like a storage shed, like a row of storage sheds. It's not like some big fancy place you think. And um, it was like a labyrinth, man. They had like an old poncho uh, thing hanging down, Mexican poncho, and he moved that thing. And there was like a like jewelry case 
but it had like a Mexican artifacts in it. And then we walked through there and there was another poncho and then it went downstairs under the storage shed. And then if you're looking from the outside of the building, you're downtown plaza like a mall, you would never think there was underground. But we walked down under the stairs and it was dark and I'm like, this is where I die, you know, this is where I die right here. So I get down there and they turn the light on and that's where the garbage bags and stuff and they got the pills and everything. But I wasn't so much scared. I was I was obsessed, you know, with the money. You know, that was my main objective. I really didn't care um, who got hurt, who got killed. I didn't care if I got hurt or killed. My main thing was to get them back to Austin, Indiana and eat and have my own boys eat. So let's talk about that. You meet with the cartel. You exchange, you get the drugs. Mm. How do you get them back across the border? That's what I was going to tell you. I have the blueprint. You know, I have the blueprint right here. And when they told me, because they're powerful people, you know, the cartel, they're billionaires, man. And it seemed like they have someone in every type of business, you know, whether it be in the political business, the mayors, governors, or whatever. They have people also working on the border, border patrol and the checkpoints and they also have people working in the, in the airline industries believe it or not over here in america so when i told them my route you know my, my routes that i was taking on airplanes they said you know let us get back with you first you know because i told them hey how am i supposed to get all these freaking tens of thousands on an airliner man and, and all the way back and they've got to go through the scanner and they said let us know uh, what airports you're going to and I told them, and man, they gave me the names of people and the schedules. Yes. Wow. Yeah, they said, uh, is there a fax machine somewhere near you? I said, yeah, down here at Kroger over here. And they said, okay, give us address and, and go over there and pick the uh, fax up. I went over there. Look, they had the names of the people, had their pictures, had their uh, TSA badges, airport badges, and had their schedules for the week, man. I'm like, man, this is some crazy stuff, you know, and uh, that's how it happened right there. Partially. This is all influenced by money, like the power Absolutely. of money, and they just have ridiculous amounts of money. They have an undispensable amount of narcotics and money. And this is 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So yes. imagine how much more sophisticated they are now with technology because you said they were faxing things over. Yes, they Imagine were. now. Oh, I would hate to imagine what's going on now. It's scary. Are you seeing of. violence with the cartel at all? Uh, I've seen one violent act over there. Uh, I went to a soccer game, you know, because the guy was like, hey, you know, won't you hang out for a little bit? I was like, oh, okay. So um, I was over at a soccer game. When I'm in a soccer game, the dude had a soccer field in his backyard. This lieutenant did. He had a big, big compound, man, and it had a gate, you know, and we went in. Before me and my girl go in, we had to give our phones up. Before we went into the compound, they said, give us your phones. And I was like, okay, give them your phone. Gave them their phone. No electronic devices, nothing. They had a metal detector. They want, got us out of the vehicle. They wanted us and everything. So we get in there, and the dudes are playing soccer. They love soccer over there. And while they're playing soccer, you know, um, I seen like a, a few guys going around somebody and I was watching over there, and they just start beating the crap out of a dude. I don't know why. It was none of my business. Start beating him pretty good, you know, get him on the ground and kick him, kicking him in real good. But like then one, the next day or the next trip, when I was in the plaza, it went down. The concrete did, and there was metal bars, you know, like where stuff goes. And Puma was there. I said, "Hey, Puma." I said, "What's up, man? Let's go out to eat or something." He's like, "Hold on, don't come over here. Don't come over here." I said, oh, "Okay." And he's got a water hose and he's talking on the phone. He's like, "Tell them to start cleaning their mess up." And it was red. I'm pretty sure it was blood. And he's like, "Yeah, I'm out here right now, and it's hot out here. You can smell this stuff, man." <laughs> he's spraying it down with the water hose. It looked like blood to me. I don't know what happened. Somebody got slaughtered or what? Wow. Do you think they were do showing you that to scare you? not to screw with them or snitch on them or anything like that no but one night what they did do is um when i went there to meet them and they were already gone right for the night well there was another dude a restaurant right there and i sit down there and uh, we're eating he's like hey you want some cocaine i'm like no i don't do cocaine he's like well, what do you do i said I'll he's like i can get those too i'm like really he's like yeah and he's telling me how much he's like hold on he's like come in there so he took me in there by the kitchen and we're sitting down and in the walkway is here and uh, we're sitting and it just so happens one of the soldiers for the cartel sees me he said hey what are you doing 
I ain't lied to the cartel. I'll never lie to the cartel. I told Heffy, I'll never lie to you, Heffy, boss. And um, I said, hey, um, I'm getting some you guys weren't here and stuff. I have to come back tomorrow. He's like, who are you getting from? I said, this guy. I pointed at him. He was cooking. And he ran around the counter. He grabbed a hold of the guy. Man, he grabbed him and put his face down there by the flat grill. And the guy's screaming. He's holding on to the thing right here in his face almost on the grill. He's telling him in Spanish. He's like, you know, that's me. You know he's with me. He knows he's with us. You got no business. He's not yours. And he's telling me, hey, did you approach him or did he approach you first? And I said, no, man, I asked him. You know, I told him, hey, I don't do cocaine. I do. He's like, okay. And uh, he let the guy go. He come back around there and he said, come on. And told me, my girl, come on. He's like, don't be doing business with nobody else. He's like, listen, when you're with us, you can you cannot do business with nobody else. You belong to us. But you were probably okay with that because they were giving you it for a good price. Yes, yes, wow. yes. Wow. Now, if you had to put it into a word or a sentence, what would you describe your relationship with the cartel as? Are you the connect? Are you a lieutenant? What are you exactly? No, I'm just a purchaser. I was just someone that uh, purchased, purchasing the pills, but they thought I was fascinating. I could tell, you know, because I have such a country accent and I get very dark, you know, and I told him, hey, I'm from Hispanic descent. And he's like, let me see your ID card. And I was like, see a Revelos. He's like, man, I didn't even know they had Mexicans in Indiana. They said, <laughs> That's what they said. I said, yeah, they, they have us. We're up there, a few of us and stuff. He's like, oh, okay. So, you know, I started building a rapport with them. You know, and I told them I'd come back, you know, and I started coming back. You know, I went down there 42, 45 times, you know, over a three-year span, man. It seems like I was going down there once a month, and it was just like they were getting used to me. You know, they're telling me, hey, you know, uh, yeah, let's go eat first, though, you know. And then here's the funny thing. One time um, I went down there. He's like, look, he's like, things are going to be different when you come back next time. And uh, I was like, what do you mean? He's like, it just is. And uh, he's like, uh, we're having a difficult time, Chris. I'll be honest with you getting these pills. Ian, I went down there next time, okay? They put me in the vehicle. They take me down to the plaza and stuff, and they pull up to this pharmacy. And, yeah, they pull up to a pharmacy, man, and there's boxes of stuff outside, and there's little bitty Mexican people coming in and out and stuff. And uh, he's like, come on inside. I said, okay. And uh, he's like, sorry. He's like, I tried to have it cleaned up better for you before you got here. I said, oh, okay. And uh, he's like, uh, I bought a pharmacy, a whole chain of pharmacies. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yes. I said, really? You know, I didn't want to ever disrespect them or be out of character, so I was always serious with them. I said, really? He said, of course. He's like, I want to try to accommodate you, man, the best I can. So you go across the border over 40 times. Were there ever any close calls with transporting it back? Yes. Give me the probably the best or funniest story with a close call. Well, one time, so whenever you're coming out of the plaza, you have to go through the border patrol right here, and there's like, five to six lines you know it's inside by this time it's got a roof over it. and there's like five or six lines and you have the border patrol agents they're either checking your passport or your id card and then over here there's like uh, two border patrol guys and they have german shepherd dogs so um i'm just kicked back i'm watching my girl you know she's got the passport and she's got the pills on her and we know what line to get in we know where well, they showed us a picture hey this is who's working the line and this is where you go don't go outside this line no matter how long it takes you stay in their line they're going to take care of you i said okay so we're standing there in line my girl's already passing everything and i'm watching man these two dudes out of the left corner of my eye just take they're probably about 15 people back from from the check uh, from the guard and they just boat start running them <laughs> dogs man they they unchained their dogs and their german shepherd tackled the people <laughs> right there in the line in oh, okay man. it's like me and you're standing in line for something you know there's five or six lines you're going to a basketball game just imagine out of the corner of your eye you see two mexican people just boat you know out of nowhere and then the people let the dogs loose big german dogs and they tackled them man yeah. i guess you know I don't know what made them uh, boat. I don't know why if they lost their nerve or, or thought they might get busted or what. But, man, they are over close about three lines over from them German Shepherds. Them boys just took off. And I looked, man, them dog just jumped on top of him and started eating you know what out of him. But that didn't stop you or discourage no. you because you were just focused on the money and yes, selling Yes, yes. Plus, I never had anything on me. When I crossed, I never had nothing. My girl, she took it across every time. She had the passport. <laughs> 
Yeah, so when she threw that passport, man, he didn't ask her. But when I went up there, if you don't have a passport, they say, let me see your ID or passport. They say, I said, I don't have a passport. Here's my ID. Then they start asking you questions. Hey, uh, where are you coming from, Indiana or uh, Kentucky? Uh, what was you doing down here? What business? You know, how long was you there? And I was like, I was over here just buying some things, visiting. Okay, how long was you staying? This and that. Where are you going now? Things like that. Wow. Now, Chris, the types of drugs you were bringing across the border in large, large quantities, these are drugs that kill people. Yes. Did you feel bad about that at that time period? I know your your outlook on it is way different now, but during yes. that time, are you ever thinking, hey, I shouldn't be doing this? Well, um, outside the I've never did methamphetamine. I did some cocaine, and um, I've only brought back, you know, just a small amount of cocaine, maybe 50, 60 pounds of cocaine is all I've ever brought back with me from, from over there. And the reason it's such a small quantity is because um, in my town I had um, a few businessmen, you know, that they like doing cocaine. I won't mention their name because some of them are still alive, and they have uh, legitimate businesses. And they did cocaine, and they would tell me, hey, you know, when I got out of the Marine Corps, hey, can you like cocaine? I said, no, I don't do that stuff. And he's like, man, I love it. It makes me feel like Superman. One of the people did that owns a big business up there, and uh, he's like, can you get it? And I'm like, no, I can't get it. You know, but when I started going over there with the cartel, I went to the guy. I said, hey, you still do that cocaine? And he's like, yes. I'm like, look, I'm like, um, what do you give him for a key, which is a little over 2.2 pounds? I'm like, you're probably giving, what, 40 for a key from Chicago. It's probably cut all to pieces. I said, I'll consider 25. And I said, it's going to be pure uh, Bolivian cocaine, probably a 90, 95% pure any, anything like has ever hit the streets of Indiana. And I'll guarantee it. And I don't need the money up front. All I need is a guarantee that you'll have the money when I when I bring it to you. He's like, consider it done. So, um... I bring back like uh, 10 or 12 pounds my first time of cocaine, and uh, I take it to Austin. And there's a highway called 256, the highway that, that I was raised on. It goes way out in, out in the fields and stuff, out in the country. And I would take it out there, you know, and bury it for a night or two, and then I'd make sure no one was following me and nothing happened because I don't want to get these people in trouble. They own businesses, and I'm very close to them. And when I finally felt safe, you know, I'd tell the guy, look, you're ready to do this, you know. But um, to, to answer your question, you know, I never felt bad because at the time it's because I knew where it was going to. This guy was probably going to break it up with a lawyer. I know a lawyer up there right now, you know, and, and they partake in that stuff, you know, some of the law enforcement. And I thought, well, I got a good idea where this stuff's going. It's not going to hit the street. They're probably going to use it periodically on the weekends. So I really didn't have any regrets with that. Yeah, but you're moving a lot of weight in general. How, yes. Describe your whole operation, how much money you're making, how you laundered the money, day-to-day -day operations, how many people are working for you, and what like the inner workings are. Yeah, so I had um, six planes in the air one night. I had six commercial airliners up in the air one night, and I'd have these uh, what I call transporters, and I would bring the people— uh, from Indiana, my transporters, I would put each one on a different flight, and none of them, none of them, every one of them thought they were the only person. None of them knew about the other ones. The one never knew about the other five. So I figured, you know, one of them gets caught, they tell on me, they're telling on me, they're telling on themselves, they're not, and the other five is going to make it, see? So I had these transporters, and um, like I say, the best I ever did was I had six planes up in the air one night, at one night, six commercial airliners. Um, one of them was going to uh, Washington Dollies in Washington. One of them was going to Hartfield, Atlanta in Jackson. One of them was going to Raleigh International. And then one of them was going to Chicago O'Hara. And then uh, I forget where the other two were going. But that's basically how that went in. I had the transporters because I would tell the cartel, hey, this is the six airports. I want to try to do something big. You know, I started out one, two, and I said, if I can do one or two, can you not give me the information on six uh, TSA, uh, you know, airline people, you know, that, that'll be working the airport in their days? He's like, yeah, but their schedules might conflict. They may not all be working at the same time. You know, and it just happened to hit the jackpot one time when I was down there. They said, you know what, Chris? 
And he's like, man, we got six. We got clearance for six airports, man, today, you know, which was tomorrow at this point. So he's like, for tomorrow, you know. And I'm like, man, that's cool because I brought eight transporters with me, you know. I'll keep two with me, and I'll put six up on the planes. So, um, like I say, I have the blueprint, you know, and I don't want to give the, the details, but um, we strap them down, you know, in the motel room. You know, I had six different motel rooms, man, in San Diego, California, and I would visit each one, you know, and I would give them the, the final details, the, the final, the master plan was I, what I called the master plan. You know, I'm like, look, this is the plan. This is the details. You know, it's very simple. You're going to get on the plane. You don't worry about it. You keep it right there in your luggage. When it goes through the screening process, the woman or man are going to be there. They know what you look like. They know your name. They got your information. There's nothing to worry about. And uh, so that's as many as I had at one night, six. But that's how it worked. I would strap them down. I already had information from the cartels um, of the schedules and when the flights and everything. And, and that's how uh, that's how it works. What do you make on on a on a drop like that? Yeah. So, like I said, those business people up there, I I suspected they were paying forty for a kilo of cocaine, cut all the pieces, and I told them I would entertain twenty twenty five. So I ended up getting them for you know twenty. I said, look, you're, you're making. You're, you're spending 40 I'm going to give it to you for 20 I'm getting it for 10 you know so I'd make 50 or 60 thousand each uh, profit each, each spot. All, all, yeah no all off all oh, total yeah off of, I'd make 10 a key so and you're sending what to each location about uh, one kilo yep so mm -hmm. the way it is now with TSA and airport security would this be possible in this day and age or is this only Man. because it's before 9/11 era well I mean, I'll never underestimate the power of the cartel, that's for sure, because, you know, money talks in this world, and that's what greases the wheel, you know. And if you find somebody that can be um, breached, in other words, you find somebody that would be willing to be breached, you know, and, and influenced with money, then the cartel, like you said, they have endless amount of money. So, Like in the prison system, we see guards become corrupt all the time over money, and we think America thinks that it's a secure system when it's not. There's, oh. there's breaches everywhere. Oh, yes, yes. And Law enforcement, everything. Of course, politicians. Everybody's got their hands in it, you know, for the for the money. But uh, to answer your question, I don't know if it will be possible or not, but I know anything's possible when you have a billion dollars, you know, at, at your disposal like the cartel. How do you spend your money at that time? And how do you clean it? Because you have to clean it, right? You can't yes. just pay cash for everything. No, and that's what got me. That's okay. what got me busted. So let's too, talk basically. about that too. How you got busted and what you were doing to clean it. Yeah. So, um, so what happened was uh, well to, to clean it first. Um, yeah, because the money was being accumulated. Man, we would be having it on top of the mattress, counting it. You know, and it take like hours to count this stuff. And then we finally went and got a money counting machine and made it easier, you know, for us stuff. Man, we would be up hours counting that money. That was the worst part. I started telling people, no more 20s, man. It, go get hundreds, man. Please, I'll give you a discount, man, because it's taking an ungodly amount of time to count this money. You know, I prefer 50s and hundreds if possible. I'll give you a discount if you do that for me. So, um, you know, it took a long time. But what happened, though, um, Oh, man, I don't want to get too much into the details about the laundering the money, but to make a long story short, I bought a lot of gold. You know, they would call them logs, and it would be like 10 gold coins, uh, double eagle coins, you know, and it would be ounces. You know, and it was like back then gold was an all-time high, twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 an ounce. So I bought a lot of gold. I bought a lot of gold off those Muslims. I called him. I said, man, you know anybody up there in Michigan? He's like, yeah, come on. So I go up there, I come back with pounds, man, of those logs of ounces of gold. And I would just go out there into the country on that farm, man, and bury it. There was a big, big beech tree, man, out there at my mom's out in the field. And I knew nobody would ever, you know, mess with that. They owned the property. And I buried that gold, man. I buried it. And that's basically I just invested in gold because you can't really trace that gold, you know. If you go to sell it, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. So you had a system. You're making great money. It mm -hmm. seems like you were running this whole operation pretty much by yourself, so you weren't exposed necessarily in that realm. How how do you get arrested? How do they come yeah. on to you? Yeah, so um, so what, when I read the paperwork, what had happened was um, I'm flying in from San Diego that night, just me and my girl, and um, 
I'm getting waiting on my bag to come out. And they, I heard somebody say, Chris Revelos. They, so I said, yeah. He's like a special agent detective bracket FBI. And he looked like a crackhead, man. I have no, I'm not disrespecting the FBI, but he looked like a crackhead. Ian. He had a, a Nike windbreaker, skinny, gruffy looking, pair of blue jeans, a pair of Nike shoes on. And uh, he unzipped it. And he had the FBI badge here. And he's like, you're under arrest. And I'm like, for what? He's like, failure to appear at traffic violation, Jefferson County, Kentucky. I said, what is the feds doing? You know, arrest me on a traffic violation. He said, come with me, I'll find out. They take me to a room in the airport, sent me there. They got my luggage out looking for it. Where's the pills? Where's the pills? I ain't saying nothing. And uh, they pull my stuff out, pull my debit card out. And he's like, here's how I was tracking you. And I'm going to sit there handcuffed like that. There's DEA, U.S. Marshals, Homeland Security around me sitting there, you know, staring at me and stuff. And he breaks the laptop out and he brings it in front of me. He was like, uh, two days ago, he's like, you uh, wired, um, I don't know, it was 64000 I think, from uh, Louisville. He's like, to a Wells Fargo account in San Diego. And he's like, you only have $34 in your pocket. He said, where does $64,000 go to? I ain't saying nothing. Man, I looked on that laptop. It had where I ate at, all the Mexican restaurants, all the clothes I bought, the times, the dates, everything. They track you, you know, with, with your debit card, credit cards. They know exactly what you're doing, the feds, man. Anytime you use any kind of electronic transactions, they're on you. So um, when I, okay, so he's like, well, we end up going to jail, me and my girl. And I didn't have not one pill on me. This is the this is the crazy thing. We hadn't we didn't get caught with any pills, man. Zero pills at the airport, and I still got almost six years in federal prison. And they didn't catch me with not one pill or her. But they knew what you were doing. Yeah, because and another thing he showed me, he was like, and this is how many times you crossed the border. Because remember, I had to give my ID and they they input the information. Mm -hmm. He's like, what are you doing? crossing the border all these times and stuff so what happened when i got the paperwork um uh, it said they got a phone call man the louisville interport interdiction unit got a phone call that me and my girl might be coming back in with possession of narcotics and stuff and um it was a guy I, it was a guy that told on me i'm almost 100 percent sure i know who it was and uh so so basically you know that's all it was that's all they had you know somebody had called so i was doing really good under the radar man really good you were lucky you weren't caught with the drugs or the money otherwise you would have been really yeah. in trouble and it also makes you think if they didn't tip their hand they probably could have caught you yes. with something that seems like they were a little eager they to was grab you. they was and they were just i read the paperwork it was like a two-page uh summary man simple did, saying they got the phone call. Did the car cartel like send anyone to come visit you to make well, sure you're not going to snitch? As we bonded out that night, I bonded us out of uh, Jefferson County Jail in Louisville. I bonded out, and then like two days later, I went straight back down there. I told Heffy what happened, and he's like, "Look, he's like, if you want, he's like, you want to chill for a little bit, and uh, he's like, or he's like, you ain't got to cross no more. He's like, you see that guy standing there? I looked over there, some big white dude, man." He's like, yeah. He's like, he's going to meet you over there in San Diego. He's like, don't cross no more for a while. I said, okay. I'm like, well, I don't want to take nothing back now because they could be expecting me, you know, to do something. So I don't want to, I want to chill for a little bit. Plus, I still had an ungodly amount of up there stashed anyway, you know, enough for last me for a couple months. And But I went back down there and told him two days after I got busted, man. You weren't in fear of your life going back over there and telling him because he could have thought you were bringing heat or wearing a wire. Or exactly. He, he could have just killed you and been done with you, and then that's it. That's what my girl said. She didn't go with me that time. She always wanted to go with me before. Dude, this is like Ozark right now. <laughs> this is the way this is all know, things play it out, man. I know because, like, you have some country boy like me from – the, the cornfields of Indiana, man, from rural country, you know, coming from nothing. And I end up being with the cartel in the bed with the cartels, man. Wow. Yeah. So how much did you realize how much time you were facing at that point? Knowing how they convert the pills and my lawyer. Well, so so when I went to jail, OK, so I go back to Louisville uh, court. Right. And and, the, and the, the FBI guy was like, hey, come here. I need uh, somebody to introduce you to. And I said, my lawyer didn't tell you I'm not cooperating. He says they got nothing to do with cooperation. I go over there, man. He introduced me to a guy. He's talking to somebody, and about 30 seconds later, he said, you Chris Revelos? And uh, I said, yeah. He said, uh, DEA. He starts getting his handcuffed. He said, you're under arrest. 
I said, for what? I said, I just got arrested 30 days ago. I bonded out. He's like, you just got bumped to federal, my man. And he said, there ain't going to be no bond for you either. He said, I already talked to the judge. And he said, you ain't going nowhere. That's what he said. They thought you were a flight risk. Exactly. Exactly. And what's that feeling? Do you know, like, you're you're caught at that point? Like, you're yeah. screwed? Yeah. So I said, well, uh, since there's no bond, I'm going to get some high-profile lawyer, you know, like Johnny Cochran or some crazy, somebody like him. How old are you when this happened? Oh, I'm in my early 20s, man. Really? Do you, yeah. What's your relationship with your parents when this is going Oh, on? they don't know nothing. They don't know oh, anything? Oh, heck no. Wow. You know, they don't know nothing because when I pull up to see my dad, I'm driving some uh, 19... Early 90s, four-door Buick LeSabre, grandma-looking car, man. You, you know? kept under the radar. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I never had no shiny rims. I never had no tent. I never had no boom-boom coming from my car. It was like when they see me, he's like, there's old average Chris, man, driving in grandma's car, four-door, you know, yeah. average clothes, man. Do you end up taking a plea deal or you go to trial? Yeah, so I said uh, I went. they sent me to Odom County, Kentucky, LaGrange, LaGrange County, uh, mm -hmm. or LaGrange, Odom County. It was a federal holdover. I do about 11 months there, man. It's a pretty cut and dry case, you know. Hey, you know, they've got you here crossing, Chris. You know, some somebody said you've been bringing this many uh, pills across at a time. If you don't take the plea bargain, they're going to take those 40-some times you cross times the amount the person said you had, and that's a lot. Or you can plead to a simple possession with intent. I said, how much uh, time? He's like, you're looking about five and a half, six years. I'm like, man, I didn't get caught with nothing. He's like, the feds can do that. It's called ghost dope, they said. All they do have to have is somebody's word that you are doing it, man. Wow. Isn't that yeah. crazy? It's but when they, when they want you, they can get you, and they can add it on even if they don't have the proof. And a lot of it's intimidation and tactics because they tried to press me in that regard you know yes. and they have the full weight of the government <laughs> that they could use they could do whatever i remember they i'd hear stories they would call up witnesses knock on the door and say hey we're gonna indict you if you don't testify oh my god things like that you know they I, were intimidating they, they were saying they were gonna indict my dad if i didn't take a plea deal <laughs> no, man, we i mean it's it just man. It, it's wild what they it's can the do and the power government. they hold yeah like you say it's the united states ever government uh power powerful country in the world man i don't want to go against them so what's that conversation like with your parents saying hey i'm taking a six-year plea deal yeah so um so my dad they come visit me you know over there and stuff make sure i was okay my sister and stuff i'm like she's like what's gonna happen i'm like look i'm probably gonna do five and a half six years they start crying and stuff you know and i'm like they was like we didn't even have no idea you know you were doing this stuff i'm like we're, you're not supposed to have an idea you know and he's like man we're gonna be praying for you you know they're very big in the church my dad's very religious stepmom phyllis gonna be praying for you. they pray for me Finally, you know, I took the deal, man. I took it. I took a locked plea because I heard these stories. Hey, you can uh, get with the attorney general for 120 months and then go in there and the judge bump it to 200 months, you know. So my lawyer's like, man, we're going to get you a C plea, I think it was, a locked plea. This is guaranteed. This can't give you anything else or you withdraw the plea. So I took a locked plea for uh, six years, I think it was. And when you go into federal prison, well, one, what federal prison did you go to and what security prison is that? Yeah, so what happened is I kind of got screwed over because I'm out on a case from Scott County for intimidation and confinement. I put a dude in the trunk, man, and I was riding around with him, and he escaped from the trunk <laughs> through the back seat. I went in to my homeboy's trailer in Campbell's trailer court. I come back out, and the door was open in the trunk. I'm like, no, man, no. And I heard like like that right there, and I was dark outside, and I could hear his feet going down the road. He just must escape from the trunk, man. So I'm out on a confinement intimidation, and uh, the feds have me, and I can't make it to court, so they put a detainer on me, right? So that gives me like six extra points, and that bumps me to high security, USP, United States Penitentiary. They put you in a penitentiary? Yes. The war, Your first that point, time ever arrested with a military service record, you go to man, a penitentiary? Yes, Big Sandy. You went to Big Sandy? Big Sandy, the most dangerous federal prison in America. Yeah, we had Chad Marks on here yes, to talk I about Yes, I know that. him. I you talked know Chad to him. Marks? Yes, wow. yes, blood on the razor wire. Yeah. yeah, because he's like, man, I know the same people you know in there. They sent me to the most dangerous federal prison in America, man. What's that like for your first time? Man, I'll tell you what it's like for the first time. I ain't got no problem to tell you what it's like because it changed me, big man. Mm -hmm. I went there. Uh, I pulled up, and there's like six guard towers on the outside, and then there's one a little bit lower in the middle, 
and it was double razor wire, man, and, and uh, with, with an electric thing going through the middle. So I pull up there, they get me out of the van. The dude comes out with a freaking a machine gun on M16. Well, I, I could tell you about Con Air first real fast. <laughs> so um, when they shipped me, from, when I pled guilty, they took me from uh, Oldham County to Litchfield, Grayson County, Kentucky. I did like 30 days there because I was already sentenced. I was waiting to be processed, you know, BOP, Bureau of Prison, send me where they want. So uh, one night they come there. They'd come at night, and they would write your name and, and destination on the window. They put a Revelos, a USP Big Sandy, uh, A-T all the way, A-T-W. And the dudes are like, who's a Revelos? And uh, little old Chris, man, yo, he's like, man, what'd you do, bro? I'm like, nothing, got some pills. He's like, man, you killed somebody, didn't you? I said, man, you know me. I've been here 30 days. I ain't no killer, man. He said, man, my brother's in Big Sandy. They're on lockdown. They get killed all the time, man. He's that's where you're going. I said, how you know? They said, that's what USP Big Sandy is like. You're going all the way. That means they're going to transport you on, on the van. So um, they take me to, um, yeah, yeah, they take me. Okay, I'll tell you when I violate what happened. But, but uh, oh, yeah, so they take me to the airport, man, and um, in Lexington. And, and so they fly us from Lexington to um, Atlanta, Georgia, man. And then from um, Atlanta, Georgia, they fly us uh, on, on the Con Air, the, the federal thing. But, but when uh, but I was looking, because the sun was coming up, I could see outside, and there was like six U.S. Marshals formed perimeters with submachine guns, man. And I'm like thinking, I don't belong here, man. I'm from Austin, Indiana. These other dudes are big timers, you know. I'm thinking, but hey, this is where I'm at, man. I got to, you know, it's time to man up, man. So they get us on the plane, Oklahoma City, spend a couple weeks there, process me, fly me back to Atlanta, then bust me from there to Big Sandy. So I'm at Big Sandy. Dude was like, uh, guards, like, is he, is he any good? And he's like, yeah, he don't have any, because they made me take my paperwork with me, man. And he's like, he don't have any kitty charges, no sex offender charges, nothing. And he's, he didn't cooperate, so he's good to walk. And he's like, okay. So they take me in there. I'm waiting on the gang unit, the SIS, to come in. He's like, uh, man, are, are you with the um, California Mexican Mafia? <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, and he's like, he's got an 033 number, which is Kentucky. I said, no. I said, I'm not with no mafia. He's like, you ain't no uh, Southsider? I said, no, I'm not with none of that stuff. We don't have no gangs in Indiana. He's like, okay, man, you've got the shortest prison sentence we've ever seen here at Big Sandy. These dudes got double life, lifers, everything. And I'm like, I wasn't saying nothing. I didn't know what was going on. He's like, my lieutenant will come in in a minute. So he come in. He's like, man, he's like, the best thing for you to do, Mr. Revelos, is to go back there and check into the hole. And in a year, your points will drop, and you'll be medium custody. You'll never see the, the, the yard here. He's like, you don't belong here, man. Your, your type of people do not belong here. I said, man, I can't do that, you know. He's like, no one will even know you're here. It's like nobody even knows you're here. I said, yeah, but I know, though, you know, and I can't live with that, man. I'm not PC up. I'm not no check-in person, man. And people told me I could walk here. I don't have any sex charges, no kitty charges, and I didn't cooperate. They said I could walk. Is that true? He's like, it's true. He's like, but, he's like, with your Hispanic last name, he said the Mexican mafia is going to be on you like white on rice, man. And uh, he's like, take him back there. So when I get back there, man, they put me in a cell, and there was no one there. Here come an Indian dude, a real Native American. They said, uh, are you Mexican? I said, my dad's Hispanic. My mom is white. They said, hold on. And then a few seconds later, here come, like, two big Mexicans, man. They had Versace glasses, gold teeth with diamonds and stuff, like on the movies, man, all tatted up. And I was like, uh, hey, what's up, guys? He's like, what's up, guys? He's like, who you run with? I said, I don't run with anybody. He's like, but you're Hispanic. I said, yeah. He said, get him upstairs, strip him down, check for tattoos. So I go up there. These and, are the inmates that are stripping you yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Mexican mafia, man, from California. And uh, so I go up there, and they're tattooing on a dude, MS-13. He's getting a big MS-13 tattoo covered up. And there was some Mexican dude. And you could see his shank, man, sticking out from his sock. And his name was Puppet, man. He ended up being my homeboy. And um, I go down to my boxers, man. They shut the door, and they said, take your boxers off, too. And I'm looking at him. And then, and like, you know, like 
screw you, man, you know, and he pulls his thing up behind this big-ass shank, man, big piece of metal. I take my boxers off real fast, no problem now, man. I take them down, so I'm standing there butt naked, Ian, you know, me and like five other dudes there, man. And uh, they said, turn around, I'll turn around. They said, you're not with no gang? I said, no. And they said, your paperwork looks good, man. He's like, you have two choices, uh, Chris. I said, yeah. He's like, one, you can run with us, or two, you can run for the door. And uh, I said, you make it pretty easy. I said, I don't have much much options here. I said, uh, I think I'll go with you guys. And they said, no, we don't need no think, man. They said, you're either with us or you're not. I said, I'm with you, man. I'm with you 100%. They said, good. Get him downstairs and take care of him. Uh, I got dressed, put my boxers and stuff back on. They took me downstairs. They gave me two big bags of commissary in, all brand new stuff, bro. Um, they gave me a radio, Sonic Walkman, brand new um, uh, headphones, sweats and in, in the plastic, all brand new hygiene, food, um, all exclusive stuff, man. Brand new shoes. Took good care of me, man. Now, can you explain to the audience what would have happened? In that moment, if your paperwork was bad, like if you were a rat, if you were a sex offender, a choma, whatever you want to call it, if you mm -hmm. cooperated with anyone, what would they would have done to no, you in that moment? No, they would have slaughtered me, man. They would have slaughtered me, and they probably would have hung me off the rail, and, just to be an example. And the prison would have allowed that. Oh, yeah. The NUSPs, man, they turned a blind eye. I don't know how many people I've seen get stabbed at Big Sandy, and I was actually part of two stabbings, man. And that one time I was holding on to that dude, man. We went in the cell on him, and I was holding on to him. He was a big old dude, man. And them other four uh, homeboys were stabbing you know what out of him. And they told me, you know, when you go in there, just hold on to him. Make sure he don't move. And man, he was uh, begging for his life. Um, Chelsea, Chelsea, he was yelling, Chelsea, I love you, baby. And he and, died? Yes, man. Uh, I was looking up at him. I'm like, who in the heck's Chelsea? You know, there ain't no Chelsea in here. And I'm looking up at him, dude, and he had tears come out of his eyes, man. And them dudes was just stabbing, you know what, out of him. It must have been somebody he really loved, you know, and probably seen him, you know, in his mind when he was dying. He did die right in your arms. Yeah, man, and he defecated on me, too. Oh, man. I'm not I'm being serious because I've already... Uh, yeah. You know, I've already uh, went past that stuff, man, and, and asked for forgiveness, but um, I'll never forget it, you know, because he defecated on me, man. It scared him, and he was yelling for Chelsea, man. But back to your question, you know, those dudes, they would have slaughtered me, you know, and held me over the rail probably, you know, and made me an example because uh, you cannot be an informant or a, a sex offender in the USP. They will kill you. No, you didn't have a choice to join. I know they gave you a choice, but you didn't have a choice. To no, join you, that don't, game. you don't have no yeah. choice, man. I mean, they, you had to game. go with it. I'm sure there's things that went against your values, like yes, this moment. Yes, yes, and I had to, I had to abandon any moral and ethical shred of humanity. I had to be self-abandoned because when I was looking around and I seen the the type of atmosphere and the environment that I was in at that high security federal prison. I knew that the type of person I was at the time, you know, being benevolent, very loving and compassionate person, those morals and ethics had to be self-abandoned. They have to be abandoned now with a complete disregard for human life, man. I had to forget any good things that my parents taught me up in Austin, Indiana, any country values that my grandparents taught me. That stuff had to be completely abandoned. I could not have a shred of humanity well, not one shred within me, man, to survive in a place like that. What kept you going? Like, what made you wake up every morning and give you hope? Were there a happy moments you clinged on to? No, there was no happy so moments, So you just man. turned dark and, and de no, I demonic? I prayed, man. Yeah. I prayed, man. I prayed one night. You know, I told God, I said, you know, this is something terrible, God, that I have to ask you. But I have to make sure, man, that... um whenever it's my time to, to do whatever these people ask, that, that I have to be able to stand up in the moment and, and complete whatever mission that they give me. And I'm sorry, man, and I'm asking for forgiveness in advance, in advance. And I'm asking you to harden my heart, man. I'm asking you to give me the darkest, hardest heart possible. And then after that, I just looked in my mirror. The first time they put me on a mission, man, I, I told myself in the mirror, um, he's like, Chris, you got to go home. You got to get home, man. You know, no, 
What, gone, yeah. Yeah, because one time our first mission, they called me up there. They said, uh, we got something for you to do in the morning. It wasn't like, um, can you do this? Will you do this? Um, you might have to. No, we got something for you to go over to B unit. There's five shanks over there. We're shorthanded over here. You need to bring them back. I'm like, man, it's a one-way movement, you know. You're going to get caught, I'm thinking. And they told me you're going to get pulled over, I mean, stopped by the guard when you get when you get going, man. Because when they call work call, they's like, go up there to the unit. They're not going to see you go in, but they're going to see you come back out. you got to make it. They're going to ask you, hey, where are you going? Tell them you forgot your ID card. You're going to work. They're going to wand you. They said, put put the shanks, man, over, over top of your feet and... um Right there is the scar, man. Right here is the scar. Wow. Yeah, and what happened was I went up there, man, and um, I got the shanks, and, and um, there was five of them, and I was putting them on top of my foot right here, and then I put my sock back over top of it, and then I put my boot on. And then when they call work call, I come back out, man, and, they, and I got pulled over, like they said, and... Um, they said, where are you going? I said, I forgot my ID, just like the, the homeboys told me to tell them. And they won me, you know, with that metal detector. It said, raise your left foot at right foot. And they went under me. They never went on top, just like they told me. They're not going to want on top of you. And I thought, man, when I put that left boot down, it had the shanks in it, and it didn't beep, then I was good, man. I went back up there. That was my first little thing I had to do, you know, with, with the mafia, man, is bring those five shanks back. Did they make you get a tattoo? They told me um, I was going to be partaking in this thing called HVT, which is high value targets, and any anything like that would bring heat to me. That they were going to be putting me close to people that they weren't able to get to, and since I didn't have any tattoos, and that was a strength, uh, they considered it a strength, and they were going to use that ability. Now, Chris, when you make the decision in that prison to go down a dark path and go against your morals, are you hoping? that you can find peace down the road and that you're going to be able to go back to the old Chris after you start down that path? Is that ever a thought? And I know you're able to regain your identity again later on, but in that moment, are you able to, you know, take a second and think and pray and just, you know, maybe wish, hey, you know, whoever's looking after me right now, I hope I can get back to that good-hearted person that was raised on good morals and I have to do whatever I have to do right now to survive— but I want to get back to that old person no matter what I have to do in these coming years. Well, I knew the importance of not showing weakness in a place like that because if you show just a little bit of weakness, man, they'll see it, you know, and then they'll kill you for it because they don't want anybody weak with them. So, you know, with that being said, no, Ian, I have to be honest with you, man. I wasn't even thinking about um, getting out. I was thinking about making it, you know, from day to day not knowing uh, what they were going to come with me next. You know, if I had to do this or I had to do that, man, I was just living from second to second, day to day. And there were some very aggressive, hardcore killers in there. And one thing I learned from the Marine Corps is how you beat aggressive people is you have to become the aggressor. So I become the most aggressive, dark-hearted person I could, man. What were they calling you in prison? What, what name did this uh, Mexican mafia give you? Yeah, so I was tired in of people. We would be talking, and they were like, yeah, they stabbed so-and-so over there in B unit like 15 times, and the dude's still alive. And I remember that dude that I had to hold his leg, man, and he lived for a few days, man, you know, and then he ended up dying. I thought, man, how terrible that must be maimed, stabbed 20 times. So we went on lockdown one time, and they had me hold the shanks in my cell. And... um I thought, man, I remember a time that my grandpa from Kentucky was sitting out on the porch, and it was concrete, and he showed me, look, you can sharpen your knives like this on the concrete, find a rough spot. Well, there was a rough spot on the concrete floor, and, man, I was thinking, I, I did have a little bit of compassion, I guess, in a sense, if you call it that, because I'm thinking I would rather see these people, if we're going to stab them or they're going to get stabbed, I would rather them die quickly, you know, than, than have to be maimed, man. Or, or whatever, you know, uh, with, with wounds and stuff, suffering. So during lockdown, man, one time we were on lockdown for like four months, and I'd just be sharpening them shanks, man. And up to that point, the, the, the shanks only had like a tip on them. 
But I was able to form uh, the tip and one side, narrow it down so much that it had like an edge, man. So when we come out of lockdown, during the mornings, I would go upstairs and I would disperse the shanks. But before lockdown uh, at night, I would go back up there and get them all together and I would have to sleep with them. That's what they made me do, man, sleep with the shanks, you know. And every morning I would go distribute the other shanks to the to the, to the homeboys. That, that was your job? Yeah. What would be like the job description title of that? What What is that called in the prison? I was just a soldier. You were a soldier, so yeah. you're a Mexican mafia soldier. Yes, uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and I have the paperwork to prove it, too. You know, <laughs> I, I brought know you were that with me, me, man. This is from a general. This is the camera recording me. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. This is a camera, this yeah. is a letter from a, a general in the Mexican mafia, and uh, they call me machine. And the reason they call me machine is because those knives were sharp and show, so good. I took them to the shot caller of the unit, and they said, "Man, that looks just like a machine. You know, come from the machine. A machine would do." And then another guy's like, "That's it. You know, he's the machine. You're hey, you're a machine, man. That's your nickname." I'm like, okay, you know. The machine. Yeah, machine. Not the machine, but machine. Wow. Yeah, so that's how I got the name machine. So you end up making it out alive because you're here today. You make yes. it out alive. You get mm -hmm. through prison. How old are you when you get out? Uh, I'm in my early 30s, man. Are you wanting to get back to what you were doing before? Do you uh, want to get back to selling drugs or are you trying? you got a second chance at life again. Yes, yes. You're so, so young. What, what direct path and direction do you take? Yeah, but I have to be honest with you. When I first got out, I was um, – people like to use the word institutionalized, but I don't like to use that word, you know, because it's such a broad uh, area, you know, it could cover. Yeah, I would come home, and every day I would clean my apartment in my boxer shorts, you know, and I would be doing burpees, you know, cleaning a little bit, doing burpees, you know. I was very structured and very disciplined, you know. That's one thing that they did teach me, the mafia and their structure and discipline, how to do my time. So when I come home – I'm not going to lie to you, and there's sometimes I would be kicked back on my couch wishing I was back in there, man. You know, I had formed such a good alliance and a brotherhood with these people. And there was times I had a girl, a friend, and she's like, man, what is wrong with you? You don't say nothing. I'm like, you know what? If I could walk out that door right now and go straight back to Big Sandy, I would do it, man. You know, that's just the way I had morphed into something, man, that was um, – it was – I don't. I can't explain. I don't have the words. You know, I was a very, very different person, man. Yeah, I can't imagine. No, but um. Did you see yourself like looking in the mirror and thinking, "Wow, I, how did I become this person?" No, it's slow process over time. You know, and then like I say, if you're in there for five or six years, man, that you don't realize who or what you've become. You know, it changes you. It changed me. You know, it changed me, and it made me someone that now I look back at it. That it disgusts me. It's repulsive and nauseating. How do you find peace from that? God. And how did you go about that? How did you get back on the right track? Man, it's supernatural. Um, so I started going to Ivy Tech College, right? And um, one time I was in class and uh, the guys were saying, uh, yeah, we got a big term, a uh, lab, lab project coming. And my dad's going to help me do this. Oh, who's your dad? Dude worked at Cummins Factory. And the other dude was like, man, my uncle works there. He's going to help me do this. And another guy's like, yeah, this, I have family, this, and I don't have, Chris, I don't have nothing but myself. You know, I don't have no nobody. And, uh, man, I went home and I kind of felt alienated, you know, kind of displaced. I was like, man, I wonder if I'm even wasting my time, you know, going to school. Is this a wasted time or what? I'm like, man, if you could show me something, God, man. So, um, like two weeks later, I get a phone call. I go to the store. My girl, somebody called, said it was a representative, Michael Murphy from in, uh, up north. I said, okay. So he calls back. He's asked my name. Yeah, it's me. He's like, man, I'd like to come down there. Oh, first, it was uh, President Sue Elpsman of the college. Real fast on that. She requests, I get an email that says, I want a Zoom meeting. She Zooms me. Uh, she's talking to me, wants to hear my story. I'm telling her on Zoom. She's like, okay. So then I get a phone call next day from Christopher Waltz Marketing, Ivy Tech. He's like, man, can you be up here at 8.30 Monday morning? Yeah, there I go. Man, it's like this, a big studio, cameras and stuff. He's like, we're going to do, uh, do a website. It's called Taking Hoosers to the Next Level. President wants you to be on it. I said, like, okay. Yeah, if you Google Taking Hoosiers Next Level, man, I'm on there. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. And then um, like two weeks later, that representative calls. He's like, hey, 
President Elbsterman says she wants to do a commercial with you. It's going to be called Next Level Jobs, Chris Revelos. I said, okay. So uh, we go to Austin to my sister's and film it, go up to campus and film. And uh, I'm like, man, this is some crazy stuff going on. You know, I asked God that one time, hey, show me something, man. So, um, you know, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm not still sure what's going on here because I've never had much success in my life. You know, and I had a lot of hardships, man, you know, and stuff growing up. Well, um, so I go to church, you know, I go to church where my dad goes. And um, the preacher, Jeff Mullins, man, from Redemption Pentecostal Church of God, right behind a police station, directly across those apartments, man, where the kids were squirting the things where I left. You had Jeff Mullins preaching there. And uh, he's saying, hey, you know, if you put your, your faith and your heart into God, man, he'll make you shiner. Uh, shiner brighter than the stars you know god will and um we recorded that man we recorded that with michael murphy and um i said hey where's it going to be going he's like we're going to get some airtime, you know on tv maybe some billboards and definitely your own youtube channel with ivy tech and, I, and i'm like man this this can't be happening you know so um i go to church again and uh man i got a lot of stuff on my mind and jeff mons man the preacher's saying giving a sermon exactly what was on my mind i was thinking and i'm like man this is two weeks in a row this has happened to me this is very weird so i go to tell god again you know hey you know this stuff's happening i don't believe in a coincidence you know uh, i kind of feel guilty from the things that, that i've done you know because man i'm the least deserving um i was a sinner man i, I I committed vile, vile, violent acts on people. I held that dude, man, when he, when he defecated on me, and he was yelling for Chelsea, man, you know, and it maimed, maimed him, man. And um, I said, I don't deserve none of this. For sure I don't, you know, and I'm saying, you know, please forgive me. So um, so, so my, my friend calls from Fort Wayne, Indiana on, on uh, FaceTime. He's like, man, are you, are you there? I'm like, yeah, hold on. And I'm like, what's up? And he's like, running down the highway, and it's dark. You can hear cars coming. He said, you ready for this? I said, yeah. Man, he puts it up there, and there's a big billboard, man, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, with me and Ivy Tech, man. And they got me on the billboard, and it's illuminated, you know, just like the preacher said. He's going to make me, God will make you shiner, brighter than the stars, man, if you commit to him and surrender like I did. So um, with all these things happening like that, Ian, um, I started feeling guilty, man, you know, I started feeling bad and all these things from the past that I had done, um, they started weighing in on me. So um, I went to church again the third week in a row and Jeff Mons is talking about this thing called conviction, man, with the Holy Spirit. And I don't even know what that stuff is or nothing. And he was like, yeah, whenever you have a feeling of guilt and everything, you know, um, and you feel, you know, disgusted about the person you used to be, He's like, it's conviction coming on you, man, and you can't run or hide from it. So I felt that's what was happening to me, man. I felt like the Holy Spirit had convicted me from what I know about the church, man, and I could not run or I could not hide from it, Ian. I thought, man, it's just something passing in my mind. It'll be okay. So I took vacation. You know, I went and partied. I went and did worldly things, man, to get my mind off of it, and it just made it worse, man. I woke up the next morning feeling even more sick, man, and feeling like, you know, that I didn't want to be that person anymore, and I didn't want to do that stuff no more, man. And and, and I tell you what, I have the messages here um, real fast. My dad asked me to drop these belongings off to the church in Uniontown, Indiana. I went up there. First, I got the stuff off this dude named Jacob Howe. He's a preacher at New Covenant Church in Austin, Indiana, and he's a really good guy, Jacob. Uh, he gave me the stuff. And uh, when I'm putting in the truck, he's like, care if I pray for you. Man, he put his hands on me in, and I had chill bumps, man, and like a real bad guilty feeling, man. I couldn't. I had to go. I just like, sorry, man, I got to go. I dropped the stuff off at Uniontown Church, man. There was these <laughs> elder people in there. Some old woman come up there, and she said, you care if I pray for you? I said, I just come and drop the stuff off. I got to go. But I'm not going to turn down no prayer. Man, uh, this guy named Kelly Reed, the preacher there, he put his hands on me, man, and all these things that I had done in the past was flashing through my head. They said, hey, uh, I said, I got to go. He's like, why don't you come to church Sunday? I said, okay. 
Sunday I come in, I go up there and I sit on the church, man. Here come that little old lady in the walker. She said, are you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. I didn't know what she's talking about. She gets me up there at the pew and I'm standing there, you know, I didn't want to say no to these people. And that Kelly Reed guy said, uh, what are you praying for? I said, man, I think that the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me. He's like, so he wants to, uh, he wants to be touched by the Holy Spirit. Man, that's the last thing I know. I woke up. I didn't have my shoes on my feet. I was drenched in sweat, and I had uh, vomit all over me, man. They said they cast a demon out of me, uh, Ian. That's what they said, and they have video. I never watched the video because I'm scared to death to see it, man. But they said they casted a demon out of me. And ever since that happened, all good things have been happening to me. I'm not sitting here telling you you got to go to church or you got to be a certain religion or nothing. I'm just telling you that when the Holy Spirit convicted me, man, there's nothing I could do to escape it, man, and, and it's made me a better person. What do you do now for work? What's a yeah, thing in so, life? Yeah, so I just completed my degree uh, with Ivy Tech, my associate's degree in advanced automation, robotic technology. Congratulations, I oh, appreciate it. Three years full-time, man. It was a job, I tell you. So um, I completed that, and then I had these people call me, and he's like, man, we'd like to get you into electrical engineering uh, program. I said, oh, okay. He's like, but you got to be pursuing a bachelor's. I'm like, man, I'm done with school, man. I just finished three years, you know? Yeah. So, um, so he's like, uh, so a couple weeks ago, I went to Purdue Polytechnic, man, and uh, I signed up for the bachelor's program. I'm pursuing my electrical engineer uh, bachelor's now. That's great, man. Yeah, I'm going to be an engineer, man. Kids, family. Anything? Yeah, I, I have a son, man. Uh, he's 22 years old. He's with his girlfriend and stuff. What about you? Are you married at all? No, never been married, man. Single, and I've been single. <laughs> Ready to mingle. <laughs> you got guess, you know. I got to find the right woman come along, you know, man. It takes man. time, man. You've been well, through a lot. That's what I'm saying. I've seen so much, man. To, yeah. to, to be comfortable with that. Exactly. You know, you know I got to find somebody, you know. I see my mother out there, you know, doing things she shouldn't have. And then, you know, those girls from Austin, they spoiled me, man. You know, they tend <laughs> in high school and stuff, you know. So I'm yeah, like, yeah. hey, you know, always... When I'm dating somebody, I'm like always kind of being cautious and stuff. I'm like, oh, I remember when this happened with that girl. She had a boyfriend, you know. So, do you and your son have a good relationship? Uh, it's broken, broken relationship. It was good, you know, but he went off to um to a place, you know, to get it get himself together, and uh, he got himself all the way together. You know, I guess he's kind of dealing with some abandonment issues, probably. You know, where I was in and out of the system and stuff, and everything. That's why I go back to I want to um reiterate and i want to make sure you know that people know it's very important to take care of your kids out there also you know when it comes to addiction in i want to bring hope man with this message to, to all my people in austin man all my supporters and, and everyone i love in austin you know that the addiction you know that's going to bring you down you know it's time to push that needle to the side it's time to push that piece of foil to the side man because there's something better for you absolutely chris thank you so so much for coming on the show today this has been an amazing time chatting with you, and yes. and I'm glad you got the opportunity to come here and, and open up and be comfortable and create a safe space to share your story. Because it's it, the first time I've ever given it, man. And it's it was, powerful, man. And don't don't ever let that you know, don't don't ever forget that our stories are powerful. The way we explain our stories are powerful, and you don't know how many lives you can change with the power of your own and, and getting to the other side of that. That's what people tell me, man, you know, that know a little bit. They're like, man, you have an amazing story. You know, if you could just talk about it, you know, be brave enough to open up about it. I know it hurts, man. There's some hard stuff, some wounds, but, man, you might be able to help somebody, and that's my main objective. I'm also very um, honored to be here, man, on your show, uh, Locked In, you know, with Ian Bick. This thing's <laughs> taking all blown up, man. You've got celebrities coming in. You've got politicians coming in, man. And it is a complete honor to be here. Thank you, Chris. And I wish you the best and, you know, stay in touch. And um, yes. good luck with finishing school. Thank you so much, man. <laughs>